since we're all in a blockchain conference, I think much of this should be stuff you already know, so I'll try to go through it fairly fast. Uh, so first, let me describe a little bit of the background here. I myself have been both in the sort of early internet days 30 years ago, uh, and now with blockchain we see a similar kind of um, revolution. And so when I, oops, so when I talk about the, uh, okay, when I talk about the previous content revolution, uh, there's this famous quote by Bill Gates. He basically said, content is king, right? And what he meant by that when he said that was, the quote was in particular, he said, one of the exciting things about the internet is that anyone with a PC and a modem can publish whatever content they can create, right? So what he recognized was, that because internet essentially made distribution cost essentially run down to zero, the only way to really make money and the only way to really grow opportunity is to do so with content. Uh, and to some extent, uh, he was correct, right? If you think about sort of, um, uh, if you think about sort of Wikipedia, if you think about sort of uh, movie streaming, YouTube, all of these content creations started to emerge. Uh, but one of the things that perhaps didn't quite work was that even though the cost of distribution went down to zero, the cost of discovery essentially exploded exponentially. So when you have people making millions of pieces of content, how can you actually find the content? What value can there be? Uh, if I don't, no matter how good the content is, I can't make any money out of it. And so Jonathan Perelman from BuzzFeed had a counter quote to this and said, yes, content is king, but in fact, distribution is queen and she wears the pants. Uh, so basically, without distribution, uh, you're dead. And we can see this today in the internet world as we know today right now. Uh, when you think about kings and queens, can there be a Game of Thrones without HBO? You know, we're game developers here. What do we do without the App Store? How many people here look at featuring as a jackpot? If, you know, get featured, it's like a big event, right? How many people here can survive, you know, and figure out sort of SEOs and mechanisms in which you can be discovered? So in fact, when you are in the mobile games industry, for instance, you're not just making great games. You have to be an expert distributor, marketer, and find a way for people to discover. And what happens if Apple and Google doesn't like you? What happens to your game? You're dead, right? So this is the world we are in today, in fact. So actually, content isn't really king. It's in a form, it's distribution. So we, um, uh, we think that obviously with blockchain, this can change dramatically. And just, you know, obviously you understand this, but very briefly, you know, 30, 40 years ago when the internet started, uh, we were talking about, uh, back then it was the internet of information. So all of you were able to access this content and information generally uh, for free or very low cost. And this you saw with text and sound and images and video, you see this with music streaming and so forth. But the challenge is that when you were trying to transfer something of value or something that was unique, you were not able to do that on the internet because I would send you a copy. So Bitcoin was a great example of that because when I transfer you a Bitcoin through blockchain, I knew that it was actually a Bitcoin. Right? Today, if I, you know, back then, if I transfer you value like money, the problem is I can transfer you money. Do I really know that I just sent you $10? I sent you a copy. Maybe I send a copy 100,000 times, which is what's happening today. And so that's why you have these trust intermediaries. And these trust intermediaries in the content world have become the distributors. If you look at Apple, I go to the App Store, I discover content. I trust Apple to give me the right content. I trust HBO to give me the right content. I trust someone else to deliver the experience that I want to see. Right? Which was not the original promise of the internet, but that's ultimately what happened. And now with blockchain, we think that can change. And I'll explain briefly why we think, in particular, NFTs play its role. So where do we fit in all of this? First of all, uh, you know, we are industry veterans looking for a change in this one, right? People from gaming, from the internet who have been around, you know, whether this is uh, sort of people like uh, Ed, who is a co-founder of Xbox and Microsoft Game Studios, or Holly, co-founder of Kabam, or myself, been in this industry for a long time. Uh, we care about making this, this change. And we're doing this through uh, our public company in Australia called Animoca Brands. Uh, and as you may have noticed, we're also co-hosts and very supportive of driving this industry as a whole. All right, enough plugging. So let me talk about paradigm shifts. Eight years ago, um, this was the headline. In 2011, just before mobile started to get big, the video game industry actually dropped. Right? Most of the people talk about the games industry as an engine of perpetual growth. Never do people usually talk about the fact that, oh, there was a period of time where it actually dipped. And this happened in 2011. It actually dropped. 
But this was also the time when the global video games industry was $65 billion. Today, last year, the, mobile, the global games industry was, uh, depending on which estimate, $130 to $140 billion. So obviously it's grown. But $70 billion of that came from mobile games. Now the important thing to understand is that that was an industry that in 2011 was almost $0. So what, do you think, what you're seeing in the game's growth as a whole, and the reason there's Pocket Gamer and Blockchain Gamer or more Pocket Gamer, is not because console games or PC games have been growing massively. It's because mobile games have come from nowhere by bringing in large number of user conversions that haven't existed before. Right? So you can thank Angry Birds and Candy Crush for the growth of broad gamer adoption. But now, eight years after, we're at a similar stage. While the game industry is growing, it is in fact only growing by about 6 to 7 percent. Right? And for indie developers, you're probably witnessing that experience right now. How easy it is, is it to discover your content? Not so easy. How much does it cost for a CPI on Facebook? How expensive is it to get your content discovered and how fast is the industry growing? So while mobile games industry is still growing as an industry, it is no longer growing by sort of double-digit growth as it used to be. And our point on this one is that we've now reached that same cycle where eight years ago a new paradigm shift is needed for the industry to sort of supercharge itself. So the big thing on this thematic and why we think this matters for digital items is freemium conversion. The $70 billion that I described to you earlier comes primarily from freemium revenues. Right? We're all in the game industry, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. How many people here who are game developers can actually talk even about a 5% conversion on their gamers? Anyone dare to raise a hand? Right? So that's the issue. Right? 99 to 98% of our users who play our games never pay a dime. And that's a problem. Right? They're all using our experiences. And you know, we can say they're paying advertising and so on, that's all right, but they're not actually paying. So they're not really invested in the game in its way. So what can we do? Because if we can change the conversion rate of an industry that is already generating $70 billion by just 1 or 2%, then actually you're doubling the industry. We're not talking about converting half the world here. We're talking about converting a single digit percentage of a $2.3 billion audience. And this is why we think non-fungible tokens and content is here, so to speak, for the rescue. So why do we think that? Well, first, I think every one of you here will have heard of CryptoKitties. Raise your hand. Yes, so I don't have to go through the background. Um, but obviously, they sort of enabled and sort of led the way. Uh, we happen to have a front row seat, uh, and uh, we're also shareholders in Dapper Labs on the creation of CryptoKitties. Uh, and the opportunity, obviously, is the fact that people started bidding for these cats at very high prices uh, because they knew one thing for certain. The cat that I bought was, in fact, a unique cat. There was digital scarcity. That was kind of the design of that. And as these cats were minted and sort of actually bred, uh, they, people started trading them. And the game in itself was a marketplace. That was what we saw with CryptoKitties. And the concept around that was the non-fungible token. So, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but I think the most important thing to remember here about the non-fungible token is that it allows essentially the, uh, an object to be permanent through the blockchain in the same way that Bitcoin is permanent, but now a single object in a game, like a sword or a weapon or a car, can be permanent and can also be unique. Right? And that is something that wasn't possible before. And let's just imagine you're playing a game and all your items are non-fungible tokens. Even if the game dies, actually the items stay alive. That changes it a little bit, and you can trade these items. And so even if the game has no, it can't continue, the objects stay alive. So we had a sim an experience when we launched our Formula One car, and this is, I think, it was obviously controversial, but I think the important thing to talk about is that these NFTs in the early stages, whether they're pre-sales you see, and we're not the only ones, People are buying these items for a lot of money. This is our official Formula One car. The first one was sold for over $100,000. And you can ask yourself the question, why would someone pay $100,000 not only for a digital car, but also for a car that has not yet launched as a game? Right? That seems almost absurd. But flip it the other way around. 
and ask the question, well, if you believe in blockchain and you know that that's there to stay, then you know that this is going to be and can only ever be the very first Formula One official car. There can never be a number two or number three, a number one. Right? Now, in the past, when a game would disappear, someone else could launch a new item. But here, it's permanent. And the other thing is, because it's an unfungible token, this item can transfer into another environment. If someone was to create a game that was sort of a virtual world, uh, they could just simply park their Formula One car in their home virtual world. And it would be an item that they owned and could show. Right? So, um, this concept of value existed for many, exists before blockchain as well. Uh, so take for instance the Dragon Lore sort of Counter-Strike skin, it was sold for $60,000. And what made that particular content valuable was not that it was a skin in a popular game, but it was in fact autographed by a famous pro gamer, in this case, Skadoodle. Now this has an interesting implication when you think about items. One of the typical things that people talk about non-fungible tokens is, well, if you have scarcity inside the game, um, you know, what utility is there if you need to sell 1,000, 10,000 swords, maybe there's no scarcity because they all are the same kind of sword. But there is a difference, right? In the real world, uh, the tennis racket that Roger Federer or Djokovic used to win Wimbledon is more valuable than exactly the same racket that you can buy from the store, which has probably less abuse because of the provenance. It has its sweat, it has its effort, it has its tears, whatever it is in it. And with games, that is also true. Imagine weapons that have won championships, or swords that have 50 kills or 100 kills, or even sentimental value that you can attach. With blockchain, you're now able to attach all the provenance and history of an item and an object. And when you think of your own items of value in the real world, is it necessarily value that has to have monetary return? Or is it also items that have sentimental attachments in terms of history that may only mean something to you or your community? So people are willing to pay money for that as, an, as a form of value, and you know that they're also unique. So this space, we think, is the first wave of adoption with these non-fungible tokens, uh, is on the collectible space. Now globally, collectibles today is a $370 billion market. Um, so again, you know, maybe there are some outliers, like expensive baseball cards that sell for millions of dollars, like the Honus Wagner card, which actually recently auctioned for close to $3 million. Uh, but what you can now do with the blockchain and non-fungible tokens is auto provenance, effectively. Every item has a history. Every item has a background that basically becomes scarce in itself. Even if a game has a million swords, or even if Fortnite sells the same skins and the same color of the skin, each skin is ultimately different because of the experiences you add and uh, add into into that object. So uh, later on, Seb will talk about one of our projects with Sandbox. I'm not going to go into the details on this one. It's like a Minecraft on the blockchain. But I think this is the added important part here where we see sort of the content revolution and where we think conversion is going to drive a massive adoption. Because an item is a non-fungible token, it means it can start to travel around. Right? even if the game shuts down. So this is a game conference, I'm gonna guess all of you play games, right? And um, how many of you here would have liked to have owned the assets that they played with some of their games that they had most attachment with, let's even say 10 years ago? How many people here played World of Warcraft? All right. And I guess you no longer play World of Warcraft today, right? But if you were able to, if those items in World of Warcraft were non-fungible tokens, would you want to take those items and move them into another game if it allowed it to do so? So that's the first question. The second one, of course, is if they were non-fungible tokens, how many game, game companies would actually make content to support World of Warcraft items? In our view, it would be tens of thousands of companies or more. Content will become like a platform because you want to be able to take the content that is used in another game and bring them on board in your environment. Now, in a traditional sense, a game company will not like that because for them, it's like a loss of users. But if you start flipping that concept around about what's valuable to the user, the end user will look at it differently because, wait, if my item can be used in 10, 20, 30, 40 different ways, will the utility of the content increase? Will, therefore, the value go up? And will I, as a game developer, survive, essentially, the death of a game because my items become more valuable and the ecosystem is built differently. 
So that's where we think the future will be. And we're seeing some of that already happening. And so we've made partnerships and investments in various companies to try to drive that. Because now, with non-fungible tokens, you can have uniqueness, you have, can have scarcity, and of course, the immutability is important. It means that when you make a game, the game might die, but the items will be permanent. They will never disappear. And what, do, what are those in, uh, implications? So what that means is the future will be that we think content will be the platform. So we go back to sort of the conversation around, you know, is content king? We think that in the future, people will actually make content for you. If you are a Fortnite player, if you are a Warcraft player, if you are a Crazy Kings player, it doesn't matter, right? People will make content based on what you own, and you will discover content in a different way. And we think that will disrupt the existing flow of centralized content discovery that we have today. And you as an end user, because you are financially vested in the product as well, are going to have incentives to promote that. You're going to have, just like we see in blockchain today, with cryptocurrencies, there's going to be a community involvement and community financial incentives to drive value in the assets you already own. If you've invested thousands of dollars in game items, you would want to have their value increase and their life extended rather than just say, you know what, forget it, I'll just lose that. Right? Remember, the $70 billion doesn't come from people paying $1 a month. It comes from people paying thousands and thousands of dollars because it's only a single digit conversion percentage. So, going here, I would say Bill Gates was right. Content is king. But in this case, now content is not only king, it is also forever. And uh, we've seen this already. I was given the notice, so I have only about a minute. Uh, we've seen this already with Minecraft and with open source. And today, when you think about Minecraft, in particular open source, which is a topic we're more familiar with perhaps, we're seeing derivative, uh, derivative ways of value derived from this kind of community building. You can't make money from open source itself, but you can build companies like Xiaomi or Android, and that's where the value comes in. And now with non-fungible tokens, there can be a new content revolution because people, the value of the content will be, will be within the content itself. Uh, and this to us will be the paradigm shift for the change of business that we see today. As I mentioned to you earlier, eight years ago, there was no mobile gaming industry, right? And it went, and it's what actually powered that growth in gaming from a $60 billion to a 130 to $140 billion. It all came from an industry that did not exist eight years ago. The other way to look at it is, is if you look at the app economy, which is a trillion dollar industry. And that industry also did not exist eight years ago. And we think non-fungible tokens and blockchain is going to deliver the same step change as it has with uh, uh, mobile before. Thank you. Ah. Sorry, a little plug. For those of you who don't have NFTs, we can get you started because you can get a free NFT over at our booth with either Sandbox or, uh, or F1. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just, uh, we'll have a, couple, we'll have like a second or two for a question. I mean, uh, I wanted to sort of make a comment anyway. I mean, one of the things that I, I learned from working on Rounty Clash was you've got to actually think about how you design your NFTs so that other games can use them, but also thinking about the kind of revenue models for that game. So we were making guns, but knowing that the games that would be using those weapons, other than our own, would need to be able to sell bullets. They'll be able to sell other assets. And realizing that kind of there's an ecosystem which is not just around you, but there's a, a sink and source, a, a game design economy that we have to incorporate, not just in our game, but to consider how other games will affect that. Are you seeing other people using that kind of thinking yet, or is that still I, fairly new? It's a new thinking. Um, game designers are traditionally dictators uh, because you design the game in the way that you want it to be and directing people in a certain way. Uh, but there is now, when you start thinking about designing a game that's for an open community, then you have to change that way of thinking. But the other thing is, you know, one of the typical responses I get from classic game designers is, oh, but what happens if someone sort of nerfs the value of my items, puts them into my game and the value is low or it's like meaningless? The issue that we have with this is there's a financial incentive. No player is going, to is going to choose to move to another game where his items are worthless anyway. So, the, so, so what we love about NFTs and blockchain is that the financial incentives are already built in. 